Thank you for the uh, organizing and scientific committee for inviting me for this uh, conference. So I'll be talking mainly about the diagnostic tools uh, for COVID-19 and actually I'll be concentrating mainly on lab diagnostic tools. So just as an introduction, where uh, it is well known now that uh, coronavirus or SARS-CoV-2 is uh, belonging to the family of coronaviridae and the subfamily is Corona uh, virini, where it is well known to be an enveloped, uh, single-stranded RNA genome with four uh, corona genera. The uh, ones that is mainly of concern for mammals are uh, alpha and beta coronaviruses, while gamma and delta are well known to be affecting the birds mainly. Now, as a natural reservoir, bats are still the main natural reservoir for SARS-CoV-2. Um, many, many intermediate hosts now are starting to show up, including turtles, dogs, uh, raccoons, camels, for several uh, genera of the coronaviruses. Now, the main structure of coronavirus, it includes certain types of proteins, structural proteins, mainly the nucleocapsid, which is a well-known protein that uh, bound to the genome to form the nucleocapsid. We have the spike proteins, which is the main uh, protein responsible for binding to the host cell receptors to facilitate uh, the entry of, to the host cells. We have the envelope and the membrane proteins. These two uh, proteins are responsible for viral assembly and pathogenesis of those viruses. Actually, those uh, main proteins are the ones not only responsible for the pathogenesis of the virus, but also they play a major role in uh, diagnosis, which we'll come into it. Now, coming to the diagnostic tools, actually you can see that there are many, many diagnostic tools uh, which play a major role. And as well, it is well known that those, uh, the global pandemic of uh, COVID-19 is real challenge, not only because of the rapid uh, transmission between uh, people, but also because of the conflict in diagnosis and even in treatment nowadays. So the diagnosis mainly depends on the history of exposure uh, to an active case, the clinical presentation, radiological diagnosis, and the lab diagnosis. The clinical diagnosis, I'll not go through it, as Dr. Jamila and Dr. Uh, Ferial have been um, talking about it uh, a lot. So it's multisyndromic um, disease, where it mainly affects the respiratory tract, but it can be even seen in other uh, systems like GI and causing also myalgia and other, other uh, uh, type of infections. Um, now, the diagnostic tools mainly include um, radiology and lab. When we talk about radiology, I'll not go into details. It's just that chest CT is uh, mainly playing the major role in ra radiological diagnosis. Although it has a high sensitivity, but still it has a low specificity because of, uh, it cannot uh, distinguish between different types of uh, pneumonia. So still, radiology will not play a major role as well as the, lab, uh, the other lab diagnostics. Now, when we talk about lab diagnostics, actually, they are used not only to confirm the infection, but also they help in staging the severity of the disease, monitoring the therapy, prognostic stages, and even also in epidemiological surveillance. So what are those lab-based uh, diagnostics that we are using? Starting from the biomarkers, so it's well known that we have some hematological and uh, blood chemistry alteration where we use them to help us, as we mentioned, to uh, uh, stage the severity of illness and the prognosis. So it includes many like leukopenia, leukocytosis, decreased albumin levels, increased level of CRP, uh, CRP procalcitonin, LDH. All of these are different markers that we use them whenever we are hospitalizing a patient with COVID-19. Now, increasing levels of um, uh, cytokines are also one of the major uh, types of or tools that we use them in order to um, uh, say whether those patients are having poor outcomes or no. 
So there are several serological markers that when we see them elevated, this means that those are um, low survivors, which include the elevated uh, ferritin, interleukin-6, myoglobin, and CRP, cardiac troponin, which indicates the hyperinflammation syndrome. Now, going to the most important, which is the diagnostic virology of COVID, so they are used actually for corrective diagnosis of the um, uh, patients, and actually they are the ones that guide the clinicians not only to manage the patient, but also to take active measures for uh, prevention and controlling of COVID-19. So those types of virological uh, diagnostic methods can be divided into direct and indirect virology methods. Points that should be kept in mind whenever we start to think of virological diagnosis in our labs is the biosafety handling and process of COVID-19 samples. And here, WHO have been dividing the uh, different types of tests into pro uh, propagative or non-propagative diagnostic tests. So if you are going to use or go with the propagative test, then usually you need a biosafety level three labs in order uh, to perform those kinds of tests. And actually those are mainly uh, concerned with the viral cultures and isolation where you really need to deal with a biosafety level three labs. While the non-propagative diagnostic test, which are the majority of our labs are using them, which includes hematology, biochemistry, and even molecular testing, then it's enough to deal with biosafety level two labs. Now, specimens is another point that you should keep it in mind that the correct type of sample is the step for a reliable diagnosis. Usually with COVID-19, we go with the respiratory samples. These are the majority of the samples that we are dealing with, which includes upper and lower respiratory tract samples, mainly the nasopharyngeal swabs, oropharyngeal, and we might go in some cases, the severe pneumonia cases to the lower respiratory, including the bronchioalveolar and uh, sputum samples, tracheal aspirates and others. Now the majority, we are going with the nasopharyngeal swab, which should be collected with the fiber plastic shaft. And this is of important uh, points that should be kept in, uh, in mind that we use the fiber plastic shaft. The ones that with wood is totally prohibited when we are going for the nasopharyngeal swabs because those swabs are inactivating the virus. So false negative will be of concern if you use the wooden swab. Now specimens should be also kept in mind the transportation period. Usually it should be transported to the lab and viral transport media as soon as possible. If you are going to delay it, then you should refrigerate it to in uh, two to eight degree, and this can conserve the uh, specimen up to 72 hours. If it is going to be delayed more than 72 hours, then you need to freeze the sample, keep it in minus 80 degree in order to preserve the virus. Otherwise, you will get the false negative results. Now, other samples that you could detect the virus from them is the stool, anal swabs, and blood, which is the least viral detection rate will be in blood. So this is why we are not going with a molecular testing for blood. Usually it's the respiratory samples followed by the stool. Now keep in mind that urine, uh, this type of sample has zero detection of those uh, types of viruses. And the points that should be kept in mind whenever you are dealing with different specimens is the detection rate where it is highest with the lower respiratory samples, bronchioalveolar, followed by sputum, and then the upper respiratory, and then it comes the stool, anal swabs, and the last is the blood. Viral shedding is a point that should be kept in mind with those specimens because uh, it differs from different types of specimens. So usually feces, for example, have a higher viral shedding than the uh, respiratory samples. Now, one of we, uh, what we mentioned is the direct diagnostic, uh, which is the virus isolation and electron microscopy. So actually, it was used for the first case from bronchioalveolar lavage from a patient with pneumonia. It was cultured on a Vero E6 uh, cells. 
Now, the virus usually will be identified by immunofluorescence. There is no any cytopathic effect on those viral cultures. But keep in mind that this is not widely used in most of the diagnostic labs. Actually, viral isolation and electron microscopy are usually mainly used in research and public health labs where uh, you need um, a by safety level three lab, and actually it's mainly to study the efficacy of treatment and even the vaccines. So it's of not um, uh, it's not a proper tool to use in the uh, diagnostic labs, mainly because of its low sensitivity, high cross contamination, and the time consuming for it. Now, going with our gold standard uh, for diagnosing uh, SARS-CoV-2, which is the real-time PCR, the reverse transcriptase uh, quantitative real-time PCR, which is having the highest sensitivity, specificity, and speed so far in relation to other ways of um, diagnosing uh, SARS-CoV-2. So I'll just talk a bit about the different target genes that are used whenever we are diagnosing um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, which includes mainly the E gene. And actually, this E gene is mainly um, used as a screening gene. While we have other genes like N gene, uh, open reading frame one, RDRP, and S gene are other types of genes that also have been used in, um, as a target genes whenever we are diagnosing SARS-CoV-2. Now, most of the assays nowadays in, uh, in the market is using minimum of two genes uh, uh, to detect the virus. Keep in mind that those is different whenever you are going vers uh, screening versus confirmatory. So usually, when you are working with the screening where you will uh, screen a large scale of population, then usually we might go for one gene, which is mainly the E gene. And this, is what, this was one of the most uh, popular uh, protocols that was dealt with in SARS-CoV-2 in the beginning. Nowadays, most of the protocols are going with two and even three genes because of the mutations that we are starting to see in um, SARS-CoV-2. And a major of example for that is the Omicron, where now we can see that the S gene is being uh, deleted or not shown. And this is where the importance come to have more than one gene to test it before you uh, confirm your result, whether it is a true uh, negative or no. Definitely, there are many available systems. Some of them are open. Some of them are closed. The choice of using different uh, um, systems depend actually on the infrastructure and the type of uh, uh, staff that you have. So usually, if you have a well-trained staff uh, who can deal with open systems, then you might go for open systems. While when you have um, uh, uh, young staff where they have no um, uh, proper training, then maybe closed system would be your choice in uh, using uh, diagnosing the um, SARS-CoV-2. So um, just in quick, so molecular testing of COVID-19 start with sample collection, as we mentioned, transportation, and, they, and there in the lab, once we receive it, we start the extraction with lysis and RNA purification. Then we go with the trans, reverse transcription amplification and then, which is including repeated cycles of denaturation, annealing, extension. And we finally ended up with the detection by using the um, fluorescent uh, detector. Now, a test result typically considered positive if you get one or more of your viral targets are positive. While when you say it is negative, you should make sure that the control RNA is detected and your target uh, genes were not detected. So again, one uh, target versus two, it depends on uh, whom you are going to screen, whether it's a large scale or you are dealing with healthcare system, uh, hospitalized patients where you need more than one target in order to confirm uh, positive uh, cases. Points that you need to keep it in mind when we talk about um, molecular diagnosis is uh, the cycle uh, threshold um, values, or what we call it CT values. And I think most of us now see it in our uh, reports of um, um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, PCR. 
So what is it exactly? The cycle threshold is defined as the number of cycles required for a fluorescent signal to cross the threshold line. This threshold line is considered as um, the level of detection or the point at which reaction reaches a fluorescent uh, intensity above the background level. So whenever you have um, the CT value, it means this intersection between the amplification curve and the threshold line. Now this intersection will be, the, it's considered like somehow a cutoff uh, uh, point. So it depends on uh, the, um, this intersection. So usually, if you have a CT value, it's usually it's inversely proportional to the amount of the target in your specimen. So whenever you have a low CT value, this means it's a strong positive reaction reflecting the uh, abundant target nucleic acid, which may indicate high uh, viral load. While when you have a high CT value, most probably you are dealing with a minimal amount of target nucleic acid, which could represent an infectious state. Maybe it's old, maybe it's viral shedding, or maybe it's just environmental contamination. So here where you should um, deal with your report with uh, cautious. Now, um, so as we mentioned, CT is a relative measure for the concentration of a target uh, in the PCR reaction, and it gives you an indirect evidence of the viral load. So the reports usually come either positive or negative. When it is positive in most of the situation, it is a true positive. So the patient is having COVID-19. If it is false, most probably it might be due to cross-contamination, uh, mis, um, uh, um, uh, misuse of the uh, different types of samples where we don't have a proper data. So usually, high, usually positive case, it should be dealt as a true positive in most of the situation, unless your lab is having a doubt where they will ask you to repeat the sample if they feel that there may be a cross-contamination um, is dealt with. While a negative result, it might be again a true negative, it might be a true, uh, a false negative. And here there are many factors that play a role in uh, being false negative, including the type of sample, the way of collecting the sample, uh, whether it is too early or too late in your collection, it is not handled properly, not transported on time. So many factors may play a role in your false negative. So in this case, if a negative result is obtained from your patient, while you have a high index of suspicion that it's COVID-19, here where we particularly advise clinicians to repeat the sample, either by going to more deep, more lower respiratory samples, or at least to, uh, to repeat the same sample for, uh, from the patient again. So message that should be kept in mind that we don't have a test that gives you 100% accuracy. So still there might be um, a false positive or false negative. And actually the sensitivity of molecular testing mainly depends on the method and type of sample that you collected, the population you are testing, whether it's contact uh, traces, uh, tracing or you are dealing with a patient with clinical presentation or and even the sensitivity of the kits you are using and the an instrument uh, that you are dealing with. So it's always advisable to use diagnostic kits with high sensitivity whenever you are dealing with uh, cases that you suspect a low viral load, like in healthcare workers, where you don't have mild or no uh, symptoms, and patients at a later stage of uh, infection. So I'll skip this, but I'll go to the differential diagnosis because you should keep in mind that, again, Although COVID is showing with respiratory tract infections, so you should keep in mind that it's not the only disease that causes respiratory uh, manifestations. So don't forget the other respiratory uh, infectiousness uh, uh, organisms. So this is where com commercial multiplex PCR now started to show up where um, it, it does not only detect the SARS-CoV-2, but also it detects other types of viruses and bacteria, like influenza, parainfluenza, and others. So just a study that was showing that uh, 126 suspected cases of SARS-CoV-2 uh, were um, uh, uh, tested, 
they found that only three of them were showing to be SARS-CoV-2, while actually 67% of them... It's done. One minute, please. I already started late. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> okay, so I'll skip the viral shedding. Um, Okay, so it's not even showing on the slide. Okay, so just a quick message that other other tests we have is the viral uh, antigen detection test, and this is one of the major tests that are now used on a large scale. Uh, especially when you go with community. It's a lateral flow type of testing, 15 minutes. It has a high um, specificity, and up to 80% uh, of it is uh, the sensitivity uh, rate. Antibody testing is one of the other tests that is now uh, being used. There are many, many of those antibody testing. What we need to keep in mind that those tests of antibodies does not say whether you are infectious or no, whether you are immune or no. Uh, so these are points that should be kept in mind. So antibody testing cannot be used as a, as a standalone test in order to diagnose uh, your, infectious, uh, your infectiousness um, position. Now, uh, the last new diagnostics that now intelligence um, uh, is playing a major role. So there are uh, some studies talking about the coughing sounds. Some are uh, talking about the um, detection of SARS-CoV in wastewater. So these new technologies actually um, needs more validation in order to show up in uh, the market. So thank you. Thank you.